first. Oh, I don't mind. Oh, thank you. Um, Mr. Tool, my name is Gulliger and I represent BCB in these before the Commission. BC? BCB. Sorry. Yes? Um, if I might just um, ask you in relation to Western Australia, um, are you aware of um, the situation as regards uh, the concept of misprision of felony? Is I'm it now a st statutory offence or do it, does it remain a common law offence? Are you aware? I am aware of that, but I don't have a lot of intimate knowledge of it. You know BCB came from, yes. uh, from Western Australia. The situation in New South Wales mm -hmm. is, um, in, rela in relation to the concept of misprision of felony, um, it's now contained in a statute, the Crimes Act. You're aware of that, aren't you? Yes. And it's uh, Section 316 of the Crimes Act of New South Wales. That's correct, isn't it? I understand, sir. Have you been called upon to give advice uh, um, regarding that section? No, to... I have... <coughs> no, I have not. Um, I was just wondering if I could explore with you the... Um, excuse me a moment, I'll just turn up the page reference. 15762, I think. Pardon me, Your Honour, I had it handy, but something happened. Um, Mr Tool, um, excuse me a moment, Your Honour, I just wanted to go to the precise reference, line 5. Um, you indicated at uh, page 151762 at line 5 that... Elders do not have the scriptural authority to take away the right of an individual to decide whether or not they want to pursue the matter or not. Remember giving that answer a moment ago to yes. Mr Stewart. And, of course, you're familiar, I assume, with Galatians... I think I'm pronouncing it correctly. 6.5, yes. which indicates, for each one will bear his own load... That's a, fair, it's a correct um, quote. Do you right. agree? Yes. Um, is that what you were referring to when you indicated there that elders do not have the scriptural authority to, to um, take away the right of the individual? Well, that's one of the scriptures. Yeah. Other scriptures, the principle of headship, family autonomy. Right. Headship. What... what as to well, a family is a unit. They're, we don't have the right scripturally to invade a family and start dictating what they do or don't do. That's yeah. their, got their right. Yes, of course, the perpetrator may be within the family unit, though. That's a distinct possibility. Yes, that's, that's true. And so you're saying that there'll be some guardian who can take on the role of uh, assisting the abused. Now, my understanding is that in a situation as you describe it, the elders would deal with the service department, and uh, as I said, I'm not directly involved in this, but in terms of working out what they needed to do to be able to ensure the child is protected. Yes. And uh, so they would work with the guardian parent. Yes, um, if there was one. If, if there was one. Yes. Um, I'm just... In, in relation to obligations, you understand, don't you, that 316 effectively um, creates a, an obligation upon an individual who comes to know or believe that a criminal offence has occurred. Do you understand? I understand. So, for example, in a judicial committee, uh, if the, the two elders, or perhaps three, um, each individually, came obviously came to the have hold the belief or know that an offence had been committed, arguably they're obliged under 316 each individually to report the matter to the authorities. Do you understand that concept? Our understanding, if I can just explain, has been that the mandatory reporting legislation in each of the states dictates who is responsible to report child abuse matters and who's not. And it designates who they are or the class of persons, and it also designates the circumstances under which those 
particular uh, offences need to be reported. Now, that's been our understanding. Coming to this commission and hearing what's been said here has uh, been quite a wake-up call for me, I can assure you, because we've operated under that understanding that that was the dominating or the prevailing legislation that governed what was to be done in relation to uh, reporting child sexual abuse. Having raised the question now here as to whether or not there are criminal laws that have an overarching or an overreaching obligation of mandatory reporting in addition to the legislation that's actually been uh, uh, specifically designated as a reporting or mandatory reporting legislation is something that uh, I can assure you we're going to look at very carefully. Uh, immediately this particular hearing is over. We're going to instruct independent senior counsel and ask them to give us a clear legal advice on what the position is right throughout Australia in relation to that and any obligations that arise in relation to those laws we will certainly comply with. So I assume... Mr. Sir, Mr. Sir, the starting point for the discussion is that it's not really mandatory reporting that's involved, which is a whole scheme in relation yes. to particular uh, offences or, or events. Yes. But this is the criminal law saying in some places you have an obligation when you know about a crime to report the crime. So quite a different character. I, I, I recognise that, Your Honour. And it's, do I then understand that previously the Jehovah's Witnesses didn't realise this sort of law existed? Well, we realised the law existed, but we were under the understanding when the government specifically legislated to deal with the, man, the, the matter in question, which is mandated reporting, well, that particular law was the governing law. Now, if we were wrong on that, we accept that, and that's why we're going to seek uh, clear advice on the matter. And so uh, it's a complicated situation, I recognise, but uh, we will certainly look at it and address the matter. So if you receive advice from senior counsel that 316 is akin to mandatory reporting or mandates that a report be made um, if knowledge or belief is held, then you would, I assume, um, in some way try and... Uh, create some literature that made that plain to the congregation? We have no qualm at all about mandatory reporting. If the government wants us to report every sex allegation abuse, of sex abuse, 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 child abuse that we hear, we're more than happy to do it. But the problem we have is scripturally, elders don't have the right to take away that right to decide what's in the best interest of the family from the family. If the law requires us to do it, we have no hesitation in doing it. Well, so the, the law has since 1990 required you to do that. That's when this section was created. Before that, it was misprision of felony. Do you understand that? To I, be I, I understand what you're saying. Mm. And my response to that was that we were under the understanding that the government had legislated specifically to deal with the area of mandatory reporting. When you say we, who are you talking about? Well, I'm talking about as an organisation. But do you... You've made it plain, and forgive me if I've misinterpreted your evidence, uh, you really haven't been providing legal advice in a significant way to um, the Jehovah's Witness congregation generally in Australia. Is that right? I... What did you mean by the question? I just need to understand. Well, I'll withdraw the question. Do you seek independent uh, on issues of uh, legal interpretation and advice of that nature? You indicate you're going to go to senior counsel about this particular yes. issue. Have you done that in the past in relation to issues that have arisen? You've sought independent legal advice? Not on this issue at all. We have on other issues, but not on this issue, because we were under the understanding that the mandatory reporting legislation as it existed actually determined exactly who had the obligation to report. Now, we may well have been wrong on that, and if that's the case, we'll accept, we'll accept the responsibility. But we're now, I can assure you, we'll follow it up to make sure clearly what the position is. When you say we were under the understand, <coughs> understanding, do you mean you were? Well, me, yes. You as the lawyer? Yes. Yes. Um, ju just to make sure we're all on the same ground. Yeah. The mandatory reporting legislation imposes obligations on identified persons. Yes. You understand that misprision or a statutory equivalent imposes the obligation on everyone. 
Yes, I understand that. Have you always understood that? Uh, well, I understood that it was subjugated or when the government passed legislation that specifically dealt with mandatory reporting, if in fact the obligation arose under another statute, you wouldn't need this particular statute. Yeah, it's a, it's, they're quite different things. Yes. The mandatory reporting legislation is a scheme yes. that requires identified people to report to identified <coughs> bodies. Misprision, or 316, as it is in New South Wales, is a general obligation on every citizen Yes, to, I, to report to the police I, in relation to a criminal offence. Well, I, I've become much more aware of it in the last few days, and that's why we'll be taking very uh, deliberate action to address the matter. But how will it sit with Galatians 6.5? How will it sit with Galatians 6.5? Yes, adhering, if, because it will effectively be against a scripture. No. That is has been continually relied upon during the course of this commission. That each bears each one each person bears their own load. So um, it will be necessarily in direct contradiction, won't it? No, it won't. Um, if I could explain why, that scripture that I read says that we have to be obedient as Christians to the superior authorities. Romans. So if in fact the superior authorities have a law that says this is what we need to do, well, that's the end of it. We'll obey. Um, just in relation, if I could go to tab um, 131A um, at uh, ringtail um, 0013. Just paragraph 14 there. I haven't uh, got it yet, I'm sorry. I beg your pardon. The, Mr Stewart touched upon... You've got it there? Oh, yes. Uh, strict confidentiality. This is um, the sentence commencing strict confidentiality in paragraph 14. Uh, must be maintained to avoid unnecessary entanglement with secular authorities who may be conducting a criminal investigation of the matter. Um, just wanted to clarify what that means. Um, does it mean that there could be effectively a... If there had been a matter reported to the police, um, so the secular authorities are dealing with it, but if the uh, elders um, wanted to conduct an investigation uh, in preparation for a judicial committee, does that advocate that they can, but if they effectively keep it strictly confidential? The advice that I give elders when they call, sometimes the police are already involved in the matter. And that's how the elders first find out that there's even an allegation. The advice that I give elders when they call in in that situation is that if the police are involved, don't do anything at all until their investigation is completed because we don't want in any way to interfere with their investigation. When they go and speak to the family or the, uh, the victim, as, as I direct them, if in fact that person wants to take action, the same advice would apply. We don't want to get involved and in any way influence a police investigation. Yes, certainly. And you touch upon that in your statement, don't you, that if the yes. matter is with the police, you effectively... And have you, have you personally instructed people not to seek to interview anybody? Yes, I have. The accused or the accuser? Yes, I have. Excuse me, mate. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, uh, Mr. Toole. I'm Miss David, and I represent BCG Hi. in these proceedings. I just want to, just on the issue of, of reporting, that um, and in a situation where there is a, a a child has been abused by her father, for example, as in the case of BCG, yeah. in that situation, and the mother was of the view that the matter should be reported, but the father. Oh, sorry, this is a poor example. In another situation where a child has been abused and the mother of the child wanted to go to the authorities but the father didn't, what would the situation be there? Well, the mother is then the protective guardian of that child. That child needs the mother to be protected. And if she wanted to go to the authorities, well, that's her right, absolutely. So even against the wishes of her husband? Absolutely, because... The concept is relative subjection. 
if she's if her husband is asking her to do something that God says she shouldn't do, she wouldn't obey him in any way. And and what if the would would the elders give advice on that to that couple to that effect that that was her right, independent, absolutely of, her, of the father. It's a scriptural principle. And, and in the situation where you do have a child who is abused by their um, father, as in the case of BCG, and there was no effort or attempt by the mother to go to the authorities or to the police, do you have a procedure, or you didn't, nothing occurred there, but do you have a procedure now that would enable a process whereby someone is appointed as in loco parentis, as the guardian for that person to make that decision? No, we don't have a procedure, but what you actually have is a, a uh, interchange between the service department and the elders that are on the spot dealing with the matter, working out how best to be able to ensure that that child is protected. But I can assure you, whatever needs to be done to protect a child will do it. If it means going to the police, we would have no hesitation in going to the police. And what about the situation where you do have a young child and the parents have... <laughs> decided not to exercise, as you call it, their absolute right to go to the authorities. Um, and that child was, for example, a young child of you know, yes. five or six. Um, what about the situation... The, the child is obviously going to become more aware of and independent of her parents or he or she as they grow. What, how do you deal with that situation? Or do you... Is there a process to ensure that... that, uh, that child can at some point make a complaint or knows that they have that right? Well, normally, it's a hypothetical situation, but normally they'd have grandparents or other people. If it, Firstly, we'd have to come to know about it. And if we came to know about it, usually that would happen because the child's talking to a, maybe a, a relative or grandparent. As soon as they became aware of it, they would mention to the elders, there's a situation here. Then the matter would be dealt with appropriately to be able to ensure the child was protected. Now, it may well be in those circumstances, if it was a grandparent, well, then the elders would help the grandparent realise that if the parents themselves weren't going to protect their own child, which would be pretty shocking behaviour, but if they weren't, well, then it would be the responsibility of the grandparent maybe to step in. Maybe they could go along to the authorities with it. But if, if the situation was such that there was no other way that we could find to protect that child, we would have no hesitation in going to the authorities. My question is more directed to how people who have been subjected to abuse become aware of their absolute right to go to the authorities? That, that, what process, if any, is there to ensure that people subjected to sexual abuse, young people, have that awareness that they can go to the authorities? Oh, I would think that every Jehovah's Witness in the country that's of a reasonable age and experience, they go to school, they do, they have all this... In, would be fully aware of the fact that if they wanted to pursue it, they'd have an absolute right to do so. Well, in the absence... Well, well given that your teachings really dis discourage any relationships outside, relationships with Jehovah's Witnesses, don't you think that a young child will grow up thinking that that is not an option unless it was clearly pointed out to them that that was an option which would be wholeheartedly supported by the congregation? We don't isolate ourselves. Children have... They go to school, they have relationships with teachers, they have a relationship with a whole host of people. To say that we live in an isolated community, I think is really reading it a little bit strongly. We obviously want our children to associate with people that are going to help them to maintain a proper moral standard. And obviously, as responsible parents, you want to be sure who they're associating with. But they don't live in a cocoon. Well... They, they are dis, they are they are taught, aren't they, as they are growing up, that people other than Jehovah's Witnesses are worldly people. They're, they're probably taught that people that aren't Jehovah's Witnesses, many of them may well not share the same values, although many many do in many respects. Well, they're not. It, it's the case, isn't it, that they're not supposed to associate closely with people outside of the congregation, are they? Well, if someone's a young person, as you described them, they're spending probably five or six hours a day with people 
that uh, don't share their same faith values. So they're obviously associating with them at school, playing playgrounds and various things. Yes. Um, just on that, just on that topic, in relation to um, sex education, for example, do the Jehovah's Witnesses today have any policy of, um, or, or have a policy against the children of Jehovah's Witnesses learning in secular schools about sex education through that secular school system? That's a, that's a decision entirely for the family to make. Okay. So, but but so, is it? Are you aware? Of, that it is a practice of families to write to the school to say that their children should not receive sex education. No, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the opposite because our literature says really it's a matter for you to decide as families. Really it's, it's something the parents have to decide what's in the best interest of their children and so uh, if they feel it's the best interest to have school sex education, well so be it. If they don't feel, well that's their right again. It's so again, for example, in the case of BCG, she gave uh, some evidence that she was not able to attend those sex education classes. So do you see a difficulty in that particular situation whereby a young person attending school would not have the awareness about what behaviour may be inappropriate? Well, I can't really comment on that, but still, that's her family's right to choose whether she wants to or whether they want her or don't want her. Families have to accept the responsibility for their own uh, well-being and their own children. That's part of being a parent. But you'd like to think that they'd be responsible parents. just want to ask you some questions. You were involved, if you turn to paragraph 27 of your statement, please. 27? Yes. Mr Joe, you were involved in um, the preparation of documents and statements for the case of BCG. Yes. Uh, can I ask, what well, you've said here that you... You accepted service on, on the behalf of a number of elders um, who were involved in the committees and the appellate uh, process in, your, in accordance with your Jehovah's Witness process. You said that you assisted them with the preparation of, your, of their statements. What do you mean by assisted them in the preparation of their statements? Well, they, uh, it came, I think it was Mr DeRoy that rang and said that he'd been contacted by the police. I spoke with him and... Uh, uh, he explained the situation. Uh, I'm not sure whether it was then or a little after, but he gave me instructions to act on his behalf. He told me that uh, the particular policewoman that had contacted him, him was Natalie Bennett. From my recall, I rang Natalie Bennett and I said, what's the situation? What, is, what's, what did you want? As I recall, she explained to me what was happening in relation to this uh, matter that uh, BCG was involved in that she wanted to actually have a statement from the three elders that were involved in the initial judicial committee. She also wanted a statement from those three elders that were involved in the appeal committee. And I said, I will assist you in the matter. So that's what I did. I went and obtained uh, statements, but only draft statements, from each one of those elders. And uh, then either I sent them directly to Natalie Bennett or they did, but I didn't finalise any of those statements. They were finalised by the police and uh, when I think it was, I don't even think from memory that any documents were actually subpoenaed. I think Natalie Bennett spoke to me on the telephone and explained what documents she wanted and I just arranged for them to be uh, produced. So just, just in relation to that, you prepared, you assisted in the preparation of the, of, the, of the draft statements. Yes. And that would mean the substantial information was put in those draft statements. Well, I put, the, I put in the statement what the, what the elders told me. You had, had you, you had been involved in the, in the internal processes of the Jehovah's Witness um, procedures in relation to the case of BCH at that stage, hadn't you? No. You hadn't. So that not at all. That was the first I heard about it. But did you not think that um, taking, that you were, that there was a conflict of interest between you assisting in the preparation of statements from witnesses to a trial? That, that involving, involved a number of uh, elders from your congregation? I didn't see it that way. I was just taking a statement by way of being assistance to the police. Did you not see that, you know, that, that uh, as pointed out, I think, in, the, in uh, document 131A, which has been referred to by, previous, by council assisting and uh, my uh, Ms Gallagher, that in relation to confidentiality, <coughs> one of the concerns is the civil liability that may flow to your congregation 
as a result of uh, any um, uh, internal processes. I don't, I don't understand the question, I'm sorry. But what I'm suggesting to you is that do you not see that there is some conflict between your role in, in protecting, if I put it that way, the, the congregation against civil liability suits and the witnesses providing a full and frank statement to the police? I didn't see the slightest conflict in that matter. I was just simply helping those elders and assisting to take down their draft statement and ensuring that it went to the police. And uh, I understood that Natalie Bennett finalised every one of those statements. She would have talked to the elders. There would have been a full and frank disclosure of whatever they recalled. I, I didn't see any conflict at all. I wasn't trying to protect anyone. I was trying to be of assistance. I'm not suggesting there was a conflict. I'm just suggesting that the appearance of a conflict... That, that, that the statements made and assisted by someone whose primary role is to work for the Jehovah's Witness Church uh, congregation might appear to be in conflict with a person who had um, clearly expressed over time her dissatisfaction with the church? with the congregation's handling of BCH's case? I was completely una una unaware of uh, BCG's situation. I had never met her. This is the first I actually heard about this matter when I was contacted by Rhonda Roy. Well, you were shortly involved in correspondence. Uh, shortly thereafter, um, you were involved with uh, correspondence, <coughs> received correspondence from... For example, the um, in relation to her sisters from her elder sister, that that was shown to you before. That was in two thousand and two, as I recall, two thousand and three. Two thousand and three was it, or something like that? Yes. Did you did you provide you provided that to the police? Did you those, those that correspondence that you received? I think she actually sent me a copy of her police statement. No, no. My question to you, to you was, did you send her letter to the police? No, I didn't. Did you not think that that would be of significant assistance during the course of a trial against BCG? Well, the letter contained about a sorry, five... Sorry, um, BCH, I apologise. Sorry. The letter contained a complete police statement by that individual which declared everything and sundries, as I understood... Uh, this case was already... I'm not sure whether it was the first case or the second case, but I understood that the police had all that information. Well, isn't this, isn't this the problem, though, that, uh, that, that the conflicts that can occur? I mean, you understood that the police had that information. You're not in a position to really know exactly what the police had. No, but if the police have got a five-page statement... I presume they've, they've got the five-page statement. They've interviewed this particular person. And, and, and you, do you recall whether that statement had in it all the information about the... Um, I don't. You don't recall that? No. Um, so what I'm suggesting to you that it... This is where the conflicts can arise, isn't it? I mean, you want to perhaps... That, that you give some confidentiality to the correspondence that you receive from a uh, member of your congregation, being the sister, the elder sister of BCG and the elder daughter of the accused, um, and you don't do anything with it. The, the letter actually says that she has been contacted by Natalie Bennett, as I recall, so she's obviously had full and complete discussions, one would think, with the police, She's made this statement which has been settled or finalised by the police. My understanding was that whatever information she wanted to contain or state would have been shared with the police or in that statement. Um, but if I can just mention, there wasn't the slightest question that I'm trying to protect anyone in this instance at all. No, I, I want, I'm not suggesting to you that you did anything to right. protect. I'm, okay. What I'm suggesting to you is the appearance of conflict, and you would be very well aware of that, that, that uh, concept. 
that, that you must avoid any appearance of conflict between the interests of your congregation sure. and the interest of somebody who was, at that time when she was making the complaint, outside your congregation, when she made the complaint to the police. I would have thought the help that I gave was assisting her. As a result, six men went and gave evidence in her case, I understand. The man was convicted, I presume, on some of the evidence they produced. Yes. And, and wouldn't it... To avoid a conflict, wouldn't it have been better just to actually send them to the police so that the police could take their statement? Well, that's a question of judgment, but Natalie Bennett, I understood, was very happy that I was uh, preparing those draft statements. Then she's got something that she can sit down and discuss with those men. She finalised them, I didn't. Well, wouldn't it have been better... Another option would have been to send it to someone outside the... Um a lawyer outside the congregation. Well, I guess in hindsight there's all sorts of possibilities, but I didn't see that in any way, shape or form I was doing anything inappropriate in what I did. Do you agree that that is an option, though, to send it outside the um, Jehovah's Witness? Absolutely. Uh, just coming back to the, the um, absolute right of the, a member of the congregation to report to the authorities. Now, a counsellor or a psychologist wouldn't be classified necessarily as an authority, would they? I don't understand your question. All, all right. Do you, are you, do you ensure that a person complaining of child abuse is well informed about his or her absolute right to go to a psychologist, for example, or a counsellor to obtain support and assistance? I can't really answer the question because I haven't been involved that way, but uh, there is absolutely no prohibition, dissuadement or anything as far as no. that's concerned. If someone wants to go, that's their prerogative entirely. No, I'm not talking about prohibition or, pers or uh, persuasion. I'm asking you, is there any policy that you are aware of um, that positively states that the elders should instruct or advise the people who have made a complaint of abuse that they have the absolute right to go to a psychologist, for example? No, I'm not. Do you believe that that should be something that should occur? Well, there are a lot of things come out of this Royal Commission hearing that I'm sure will be considered very carefully and very considerately over time. Is that something that you believe should occur? Me personally? Yes. I guess that would depend on the circumstances, but uh, there's nothing wrong or inappropriate about it at all. Uh, does it uh, go against your scriptures to speak to counsellors no, outside? No, not at all. People have an absolute right to speak to whoever they want to. Uh, just on the other, when, when people, the either the uh, victim... Or or the survivor of abuse, but, you know, the person who has been abused, when they are being informed of their absolute right to go to the police, for example, are they made aware of what might happen to their complaint if it, if it is not made quickly? All right, I'll put it this way. Are you yourself aware of how delay in reporting a case of abuse can impact upon the subsequent trial? Yes, I am. Can you inform... Well, what is your understanding of, of the difficulties? Well, obviously, the further you remove from the event, the more difficult evidence is. People's recollections has obviously been evidence of this hearing here. People are trying to remember events that took place 26 years ago. I sometimes have difficulty remember what I had for breakfast yesterday. So uh, it's difficult. I appreciate it. Is, is that explained when you are giving that advice to the uh, either the parents or the person who has actually been abused? Is that explained to them? I don't believe it is, but it's something that we could take on board. And just in the process, do you understand that, that clearly, I think, you, you've been watching these proceedings over the last... Yes. Period, and during the course of those proceedings, there's been a lot of reference to the procedure 
the committee pre procedure whereby, uh, well, the two case study examples, for example, BCG and, and BCB, uh, in BCG's case, how terror petrified she was in that uh, committee process, the, whereby she had to give evidence or, you know, tell her story in front of her father and three male elders. You've, you were aware of yes, that? Yes, I, I heard what you said. And would you agree that that very process it does not lend itself to a young uh, abused person being full and frank about the detail of what actually happened to them? Absolutely, but I understood the evidence that was given yesterday by Mr Spinks shows that just simply wouldn't happen today unless someone wanted to actually confront the, uh, the abuser. But, but what, I, what I'm getting at is that by taking, by choosing to go through your process, the committee process, if a person who had been abused uh, chose to go through that process, even if it was in writing or they took some less um, terrifying way of, of doing it, as it pointed out that, for example, that, that at the, when they finally get to court, if they haven't given a full and frank... If they, have if a, they haven't provided a detail, a level of detail in the committee process and they're subsequently cross-examined... Uh, about a, sub, a later uh, account which has more detail, that they could be heavily criticised through that court process? There's inconsistent statements. You're, you would be well aware of the yes. difficulties when there's inconsistent statements. What I'm asking you, are those matters ever pointed out to the elders when they're advising young uh, or people who are abused? Well, in answer to, <coughs> excuse me, in, in answer to your question, it's the same as before. The instructions are to make sure they're fully aware. As I understand, the elders don't explain to them the point that you've made. I've, take that on, I've taken that on board and I'll certainly add that uh, in terms of any advice that I give anyone in the future. Uh, so they're made fully aware of that. And, and would it be a possibility for them to be advised independently of the elders, for Absolutely. example, Absolutely. by someone like yourself, of all those particular... Um, outcomes if, if they don't make the complaint? If they, if they chose to, I'd be more than happy to uh, assist them in that way. And, and what about seeking again, uh, that they referring them to uh, outside? What about? Uh, referring them to outside legal representatives. Absolutely. They're perfectly free to go to whoever they want to. This is their, this is their right. Uh, they're not stopped in any way, shape or form from doing what they feel is in their best interests. Um, just want to ask you about one other aspect, and that is the as a soldier, as a Jehovah's Witness, that as a soldier of Christ, you are essentially in a theocratic warfare um, against those that uh, have a different view of um, religion. Is that the case? No, I don't think that's well, the Are you aware of the doctrine of theocratic warfare? No. Never heard of it? Well, I've heard the expression, but I'm not really sure what it means. So you don't know what it means? No. OK. Um, have you heard that in, in the watchtowers in 1957 and 1960 that they say that as a soldier of Christ, you are in theocratic warfare and you must exercise added caution when dealing with God's foes? Thus, the scriptures show that for the purpose of protecting the interests of, God call, of God's cause, it is proper to hide the truth from God's enemies. Have you heard of that? No, and I've never read 1957 magazine articles. I'm sorry. I only became a Jehovah's Witness in 1972. <laughs> but you, as a lawyer, would be aware of um, such uh, concepts, wouldn't you? But you can lie to protect... Jehovah's name? We are truthful. To be a Christian, you have to be truthful. Is there any occasion when there's a basis for keeping the truth from outsiders? Well, if, uh, if uh, our congregation was being persecuted, like it happened in the times of Adolf Hitler, 
and he was taking people to uh, concentration camps because they wouldn't join his army and go to war, and somebody came to me and said they wanted a list of everybody in the congregation, uh, I wouldn't tell them. I'd like to think I wouldn't anyway under those circumstances. It might cost me my life, but I'd like to think that I wouldn't divulge that information because I know the consequences would be for the people that I, to that I uh, divulge that about. And the concept of malicious lying, is there a different concept of malicious lying that in the Jehovah's Witness? Well, yes, there is to some degree in the sense that sometimes you can tell what you saw in an event, someone else says what they saw in the event, and the two stories don't really agree too well, it doesn't mean that you're actually lying. No, that, but that, 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 with but if, that. I, if someone is actually setting out with malicious intent to, in fact, undermine or destroy or whatever the case may be, that's the case. In the situation that that memo that was put to me before, I would say that's a classic case of malicious lying. This man is deliberately and maliciously lying about what he did to his daughter and what he admitted to doing to his daughter. So, so the, what the, the example that you gave before is really not, it's not a question of lying. It's a different... Honest people can be wrong. and, and yeah, that, sure, that, sure. They can. So it's not a question of lying. They have a different recollection, and it's simply that. But I'm just talking about deceiving, that uh, falsehoods presented to God's enemies are not considered lies if, um, if it's to deceive outsiders to advance the organisation's interests. Uh, that's... that's, uh, that's a, I've never heard that. Never heard that. No, that's wrong. a completely foreign concept to my understanding. Okay. I just want to ask you something else. When a person is uh, disfellowshipped, they can still sit, they can still attend Kingdom Hall, can't they? Yes. And they can sit up the back of Kingdom Hall. Yes. And they can enter after the, con the congregation is uh, entered, and they can, as long as they leave, enter and leave. Uh, before um, the congregation. I don't think there's any strict rule about it, but they normally would do that anyway. But they really aren't associating with the congregation at all. So there's nothing to prevent, for example, a disfellowshipped person from attending the same congregation as the... Uh, a person disfellowshipped on the basis of being a sex abuser. There's nothing from to prevent in your faith from attending at that uh, congregation, is there? No, but if it was going to be offensive to the victim, there would be a very clear instruction given to them that this is very inappropriate, because obviously the effect of that... Sometimes you have situations where there's been an adulterous situation in marriage or something like that, and you've got someone here and someone here. It uh, sometimes is very unpleasant, and the elders would certainly discuss that with the... Uh, the wronged or the person that's wronged the other and ask them if they could make some other arrangements out of sensitivity to the person's uh, but that's, a, that's the highest you could ever go. You could go to that disfellowship person, ask them not to come, couldn't you, to the congregation? Yes. But you couldn't actually tell them... Uh, you, you couldn't uh, ban them, could you, from the congregation? Well, unless they were causing major difficulties, we couldn't. It's a, it's a meeting that's open to the public... If they sat there, if they're, uh, in the extreme example you're discussing, ultimately, I guess, uh, it would have to be considered. But if there was a real problem in that regard, what would happen is the elders would contact the service department, they'd discuss it thoroughly and work out how the principles that we operate would apply in that situation to be able to address the matter. And uh, would you involve the police in that, in the removal of someone from... if they, they were, were requested not to go and then... If we've had people come to Kingdom Halls that have been creating a disturbance and uh, we have involved the police, we've revoked their implied invitation to come and uh, so they become a trespasser if they're there. We're quite happy to do that if that's, if that's necessary. Uh, just one other matter. Uh, just before this commission, uh, there was, as I understand it, two people from the congregation who were not concerned whether they took an oath on the Bible or an affirmation, are you able to make any comment about why someone would, uh, someone who was a member of the Jehovah's Witness congregation would not <coughs> automatically think that it would that they would swear an oath on the Bible? 
if you want my honest opinion, it's possibly the first time they've ever been put in a forum like this and they're frightened and so terrified of the whole experience. They really probably weren't sure what they should be doing. And so uh, it was, it's a pretty daunting experience for some people that have never been confronted with it before. Is there any guidance on, on that from the legal department? No. That's a matter entirely for an individual. Would you find it unusual, though, for someone not to automatically want to swear on a bile? If it was a considered opinion, they thought about it for quite a lot and they didn't want to swear on a Bible, I'd, and I knew them well enough to ask them, I'd ask them why not, just as a, as a point of interest to, to satisfy myself. But Mr. there's no Mr. hard Mr. and fast there rule. Are, there are some devout Christians who, yeah. out of respect for the Bible, won't swear on the Bible. Yes, Your Honour. I'm not sure that this is an no. issue worth pushing. No, no, no. I appreciate that, Your Honour. Thank you, Your Honour. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, yes, Your Honour, um, just briefly. Mr Toole, my name is Miss McGlinchey and I appear for Monty Baker in these proceedings. Thank you. Um, Mr Toole, you've said on a number of occasions in your evidence that if it was necessary to protect a child, you would have no hesitation in going to the police. That's correct. All right. Just to be clear, is the effect of your evidence that you have never, in fact, done that? No, I haven't. Is the effect of your evidence that you have never, in fact, advised a member of the Jehovah's Witness to report a matter to the police? No, I haven't, because I don't give that advice. The Service Department Thank deals you. with that. Thank you. You have an employed solicitor? Well, I have a, a solicitor that uh, is in my firm, but uh, they operate on the same basis that I do. We, uh, we're just members of the order. She, uh, she's associated and works under, uh, under my guidance, yes. Her, and her practising certificate does note that she works for your um, firm? Yes. All right. Do you supervise her? Yes. Right. When, she... when we're doing, when we're doing uh, uh, work in, uh, in my capacity as an independent solicitor, yes. And she's a member of... You have a fairly heavy burden as a lawyer, as a senior lawyer advising the Jehovah's Witnesses. Is that correct? Yes, but I'm advising them in only one area, and that's their obligations to report under the mandatory reporting regime. I'm not dealing with child sexual abuse per se. I'm simply just giving legal advice, like any lawyer would if you walked into his office and said, what obligations do I have in these circumstances to report a matter in this particular state? Just to be clear, have you ever advised in your capacity as a lawyer of, um, anybody to report under the mandatory um, system? Yes, I mentioned that to Council this morning, I have. All right. Um, I just want to understand how your practice works. Do you have an office? Yes. All right, which you attend on a daily basis? Yes, but I'm, I'm also a corporate lawyer and I do work along with the, uh, with the branches doing normal administrative legal related work. But there are times if I take on a client, well, then I'll act for them independently. A Jehovah's Witness client? Any client, but generally it's one of Jehovah's Witnesses, yes. All right. And in relation to your supervision of uh, Miss uh, Van Whitson, yes. does she attend the office as well? Yes. All right. And she works under your supervision? Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Honour. Um, Mr. Tall, as you know, my name's Andrew Tokley. I represent the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Australia, and I also represent you, Mr. Spinks, and Mr. O'Brien. Uh, could I please have um, the document behind tab 82? Its ringtail number is uh, 244. And uh, Mr. Tool, do you see that what's brought up on the screen? Yes. If your child is abused? Yes. And do you understand this to be part of a uh, an awake publication? Yes. Could could the screen please be lifted up a little bit to see the date on the bottom? Uh, the other way, please. Thank you. And you see there it's a publication of the uh, October 8, 1993. Yes, I do. And if you could now please go down a little bit. Down or up? Down. But keep going down, please. So do you see? Now, if you look at the second column uh, on the right-hand side. Yes. And do you see the paragraph beginning there, uh, what though? Yes. And do you see it says, what though when the abuser is one's own beloved mate? Yes. And do you recall being asked questions about... What might happen in a situation in which, for example, the husband is an abuser of person? Yes, I do. And do you see the um, what it says there is sad to say many women fail to take decisive action? Yes. Uh, to be sure, it, could, it is never easy to face the ugly reality of a mate who is a child abuser. Yes. The emotional ties and even financial dependency can be overwhelmingly strong. The wronged wife may also realise that taking action could cost her husband, his family, his job, his reputation. Yes. And also continues, the hard truth is, though, that he may just be reaping what he has uh, sown. Uh, innocent children, on the other hand, stand to lose much more if they are not believed and protected. Their whole future is at stake. They do not have the resources that adults have. Trauma can scar and shape them adversely for life. They are the ones who need and deserve tender treatment, and it says compare Genesis. Now, is the instruction uh, in that paragraph consistent with your understanding of how these matters are approached by the Jehovah's Witness faith? Absolutely. And if you go down to the next paragraph, please, beginning parents. <coughs> Excuse me. Parents must therefore make every reasonable effort to protect their children. Many responsible parents choose to seek out professional help for an abused child. Just as you would with a medical doctor, make sure that any such professional will respect your religious views, help your child rebuild his or her shattered self-esteem through a steady outpouring of parental love. And is that consistent with your understanding of what the Jehovah's Witnesses' view is of the role of parents, and in particular, the role of responsible parents? Yes, it is. So that a responsible parent would choose to seek out professional help for an abused child. Yes. Thank you. Now, I wonder if I might be able to provide to the witness, Your Honour, a copy of a document that's been provided by a learned friend. Uh, it's an unredacted document. Um, this, I have copies for the Commission. I'm happy to... Uh, obviously, no names should be mentioned, Mr. Tull, because it's an unredacted document. And I'm happy to provide it to counsel for all parties on the basis that they keep the names confidential. Thank you. You've given me two. Did you want to... Are there, are there plenty? I've got two. You have before you an email. Yes. And it was um, it's dated the fourth of May two thousand thirteen. Yes. And 
Was that email solicited by you or provided to you by the author of the email? Provided by the author. And uh, again, without naming any names, was the email from a member of the police force? Yes. Uh, and was the, the person a senior member uh, of the constabulary? <laughs> was the person a senior member of the constabulary? I understood so, yes. And again, without naming any names, was the email to you to thank you for the assistance that had been provided by some elders in relation to the conviction of a person for indecent assault? Yes, it was. And um, no, I have no further questions on that document. Thank you. Uh, and you have, you've do given you want, evidence. Do you want it to go into evidence? Uh, Your Honour, in its redacted form, we'd be happy for the matter to go into evidence. Uh, in its unredacted form, in order to preserve the confidentiality of the persons concerned, uh, perhaps or not going to... Well, the point is that in this instance, the senior constable expressed her appreciation yes, for what was done. Do we need more than that? Yes, Your in which case we might give it back to you so that there's no chance of there being any breach. Thank you, Your Honour. Thank you, Your Honour. I have no further questions. No. Mr Stewart? Nothing further, Your Honour. Yes, thank you. That concludes your evidence, Mr Tilton. You're excused. Thank you. The next witness is Mr. Terence John O'Brien. instructions on that matter. Um, I, ne I will need to speak to the author of the document, Mr. H. V. Moretz. I understand he's an, an elderly gentleman in his 90s now, um, but I want to make sure that the answer we provide to the Commission is correct, and if need be, I will provide an affidavit from Mr. Moritz uh, about that matter. My present understanding is that the uh, Service Department did not, in fact, maintain a list of individuals it could be generated from a com by the computer. Uh, whether that was Mr. Moritz's understanding at the time is the matter I need to clarify. Very well. Um, Mr. O'Brien, if it's necessary for you to be sworn, would you take an oath on the Bible? Would you stand for me? Take the Bible in your hand and repeat after me, I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give in this Royal Commission the evidence I shall give at this Royal Commission shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Take a seat. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Brown, please. Mr. Brown, will you state your full names, please? Yes, my name is Terence John O'Brien. And Mr. O'Brien, we have uh, two statements from you, one dated 10 July 2015 and one dated 16 July 2015. Do you have those to hand? Yes. Are there any amendments you wish to make to either of those statements? I think I actually had a third statement as well, dated 24 July, which was a correction of one point in my first statement. Is that corrected an aspect in relation to an involvement in a child sexual abuse allegation? That was, that was one, yes. yes. So taking the second statement to be corrected in that respect by the third, are there any other corrections you wish to make? 
No. So, so you confirm the statements to be true and correct? I do. Thank you. I tender the three statements, Your Honour. Well, the Exhibit 29 and 24 as to the first one, then 29, 25 and 29, 26 for the other two. That's your Honour, please, it's not. <coughs> Mr O'Brien, you are currently the coordinator of the Australia Branch Committee of the Jehovah's Witnesses, is that right? In the Australia Branch, yes. Go back on that. Are, are you seeking to qualify and say you're not coordinator of the Australia Branch Committee? Of the Australia Branch Committee. Sorry, that's correct. And you've been a member of the Australia Branch Committee since March 2005? That's correct. And since when have you been the coordinator of that branch committee? I think for about the last three years I was acting coordinator for most of two of those years, and the coordinator, Mr Moritz, was overseas, but for the last um, almost one year I've been the permanently assigned coordinator of the branch committee. Thank you, and prior to that, um, you've been a Jehovah's Witness since 1975, is, is that right? That's correct. You baptised in 1976? Yes. And a you were a ministerial servant in the period 1977 to 1980? Correct. And you've been an elder since 1980? That's right. And in the decade 1987 to 1997, you served as a circuit overseer in Australia? I did, yes. And from 1997 to 2003, you served as a member of the branch committee of the India branch of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Is That's that right? right, yes. And I take it then in 2003 or four, you returned to Australia, is that right? Yes, 2003, returned to Australia. Now, dealing first with the Australia branch committee itself, how many members are there? Uh, presently, we have 12 members. And if I understand it correctly, they are all elders, is that right? All elders, yes. And that's a requirement, that to be a member of the branch committee, one must be an elder? Must be, yes. And so it follows, therefore, that to be a member of the branch committee, one must be a man? Correct. And uh, who are the 12 members, Mr O'Brien? Yes, so there's myself, of course. Then there's Alan Wood, Graham Martin... Winston Payne, Vaughan Guy, who is temporarily overseas on an assignment, um, you have Donald McLean, Viv Moritz, uh, Douglas King, who is infirmed, not an active member of the branch committee, um, Michael Davies, and Ivan Novion. I think there's a 12. 10, I think we have, Mr. O'Brien, including you. Okay. <laughs> O'Brien, Wood, Martin, Payne, Guy, McLean, Moritz, right. King, Davies, and Nabion. Okay, Gregory Frank is an 11th. And I'll just have to check who, who I've missed. Yes, fair enough. Thank you, um, thank you Mr. O'Brien. And are all those members serving in that capacity full-time? Yes. So they're in full-time ministry, as it were, in that capacity? That's correct. And that makes them all members of the worldwide order of special full-time servants of Jehovah's Witnesses? They are. And so they're all be looked after, as it were, in a similar way to that explained by Mr... Spinks. Spinks. Phil. Yes, exactly the same situation. Yes, thank you. And uh, they are appointed by the governing body, is that right? That's correct. And is there a particular length of term of office? No. So they're appointed until what? They either retire or are removed? Yes, or expire. 
or, or reassign. Mm. Yes, it can be the case too. Now, in paragraph 8 of your statement, perhaps we can have that up. You say that... Um, in the second line from the bottom, the theocratic or scriptural direction that the governing body provides is the same in every branch and for all of Jehovah's Witnesses um, worldwide. Now, starting with the means by which that direction is provided, as I understand it, that direction is provided through the various published uh, manuals and magazines, is that right? Manuals, magazines, uh, letters can be to congregations. Yes, well, I was going to get to that as well. It's also um, directives or letters to branches, is that right? That's correct. And would the governing body publish such letters directly to congregations, or, or would that be to the branch for the branch to then publish on to the congregation? Yes, I can't think of a an instance where a letter was directly sent to the congregations, but in the um, annual yearbook that is released, there's a letter in the foreword of that, which is a letter from the governing body uh, directly to every member of the congregation worldwide. And what scope is there for branches, such as the Australia branch, to suggest or request changes or participate in any process of change with regard to the theocratic or scriptural direction? Yeah, the, the branch committee doesn't generally get involved in scriptural interpretation. That's left to the governing body to provide that. Uh, the branch committee's general area of oversight is administering branch matters to do with the, the territory in which they oversee. Field ministry conventions, things such as that. And the reason for not being involved in scriptural interpretation, is that because the governing body um, are seen as, as being Jehovah's representatives on earth who, who give the scriptural interpretation, the definitive scriptural interpretation? Yes, yeah, so they will, my understanding is the governing body will um, approve the information, but they have other, what they refer to as helpers and various committees who assist them in um, researching and formulating some of the suggestions that would then go to the governing body for approval or adjustment, depending. And so, as I understand it, there would be no scope for a branch, an Australia branch, to adopt a different scriptural interpretation from that of the governing body. I'm not aware of it happening. Yes, yes we'll take the lunch in a gym.